It has been an extraordinary day in the Senate today, and it shows the kind of progress that can be made even on bedeviling issues when persistence and optimism uh, are brought to bear. And I hope that uh, my continued efforts on climate change will uh, ultimately produce, with the same persistence and optimism, the same success we've seen uh, today on immigration. This is the 37th time that I will have come to the floor to urge my colleagues to wake up to the threats that we face from climate change, to wake up, to stop hiding behind the distortions that are spread by the fossil fuel interests, and to start heeding the warnings of scientists, of economists, of insurers, of businesses, of national security officials, of religious leaders, they all say something needs to be done and fast to stave off the harm of carbon pollution. For the first time in this speech, I can say that something at last is being done. This Tuesday, President Obama laid out a national plan to reduce carbon pollution and to prepare our country for the effects of climate change. His plan is a bold one, and it is going to challenge the status quo. Most important, the administration will regulate greenhouse gas emissions from new and existing power plants. If we're going to be serious, we need to strike at the heart of the problem, and regulating these big power plants is the, first, the best first step. And let's face it, until now, these big polluters were getting a free ride. They were harming all of us with their admissions and paying no price for it. Carbon-driven climate change hurts our economy, damages our infrastructure, harms our public health. Economists call this price that we all pay the social cost of carbon because it represents the cost that polluting corporations offload onto the rest of us, onto the rest of society. Earlier this month, the Obama administration revised its estimate of the social cost of carbon to $36 per ton of carbon dioxide emitted. This new estimate better captures the true harm of carbon pollution to our oceans, to our farmland, to ourselves, and I commend the President for strengthening our economic assessment of climate change. The administration's measure still falls short of some experts' calculations, however, such as the comprehensive review that prompted far-reaching climate change legislation in the United Kingdom. I think our estimate should be still higher to accurately reflect the cost of climate change. And I think the best way to address the mounting social cost of carbon is a carbon fee. If we start charging these corporations a fee based on the social cost of their carbon pollution, that will factor those costs into their price, into their business models. And that is Economics 101. A carbon fee, in other words, makes the market work properly by putting the costs of carbon pollution into the price of the product instead of letting the big polluters freeload on the general public. It's a simple choice. Do we want the American people, children and seniors, small business owners and homeowners, to pay the price of carbon pollution? Or do we want to have the corporations behind that pollution take responsibility for the harm, to balance the energy markets, and to encourage American clean energy technologies. We're already hearing the familiar refrains of the deniers, the skeptics, and the big polluters trying to scare us into protecting the status quo. A carbon fee, quote, slows down our ability to compete, claims one of my Republican colleagues. The cost of nearly everything built in America would go up, declared another. The Speaker of the House warned that if we put a price on carbon, and I quote, the United States economy would suffer, millions of family wage jobs would be lost, and American consumers would incur dramatically higher prices for energy and consumer goods, all without any 
significant environmental benefit whatsoever. These are scary predictions, but are they true? Actually, the World Wildlife Fund and the Carbon Disclosure Project found that investments to reduce carbon pollution yield greater financial returns for companies than do their overall capital investments. So never mind the huge environmental benefits, cutting back on greenhouse gas emissions by just 3% each year would save U.S. businesses up to $190 billion a year by 2020, or $780 billion over 10 years. And that supports American leadership in new clean energy technologies, powering our economy. So it should overall be good for business. And what about American families? The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimates that a carbon fee starting at around $28 per ton of carbon dioxide emitted, which is within the price range recommended by economists, would result in a 2.5 percent increase in costs for the lowest income households and a 0.7 percent increase for the richest ones. It's higher for low income families because they're likely to spend more of their budget on home heating, on gas, and on other energy. What the carbon fee fearmongers overlook is the substantial revenue generated by a carbon fee. According to CBO, a fee starting at $20 per ton would raise $1.2 trillion over the first 10 years. That revenue doesn't just disappear. When Senator Schatz, Congressman Waxman, Congressman Blumenauer and I put forward a carbon fee discussion draft earlier this year, we left the use of the proceeds from the fee open for discussion. We want to work with other members, particularly with those on the Finance Committee, whose leadership I see here, to find a use for the revenues that puts that revenue to work for the American people and propels the economy. Every penny of that carbon fee revenue could go back to the American people. There are a lot of ways to do this, so let's consider a few examples. We should start by setting aside about $140 billion, or 12 percent of the total, to help lower-income households pay for their 2.5 percent cost increase. That would leave us with more than a trillion dollars to send back to people in other ways. That's a lot of money, even by Washington standards, and it can do big things. Senator, with the Senator, I hate to interrupt. I, I, would you be willing to yield for two minutes so I could thank some people on immigration, and I promise I will take no more than two minutes. Uh, may, let me respond to the distinguished Senator. The answer is yes. Um, I also see our distinguished Chairman of the Finance Committee and his ranking member on the floor, and I understand that they have a colloquy they'd like to engage in. Do they have an estimate as to how long they would like to engage in that colloquy? Senator from Montana. Mr. President, may I ask um, the uh, Senator from Rhode Island how much time he wishes to how much time I he have has about another on. 10 minutes of speaking, and what I'd propose to do, I don't know how long you'd like to take, what I'd propose to do is yield to the Senator, uh, Senator Graham, Two minutes. for such time as he may need. Two and minutes. Then Mr. President, um, um, I'm, it's fine. I think we should wait for the, let, let the Senator from Allen proceed the statement. And if the Senator from South okay. wants to go ahead, yeah, that's fine. It's whatever you, to, you work out. Great. All right. Well, let me, I'll yield the floor to okay. uh, Senator Graham. Uh, to all my Senate colleagues, today was a good day, a historic day for the Senate. Thank you all for the opposed to support of the bill. It was a great debate. To the staff, uh, we, we, this bill could have died a thousand times. You wouldn't let it. Uh, to Matt, you're just awesome. Sergio and David and my staff, thank you for just endless hours of work below minimum wage. Mark and McCain's office, thank you for working for Senator McCain. Your reward will be in heaven. Uh, Chandler, you're awesome working for Jeff. Enrique, uh, you're one of the smartest people I've ever met. John. Uh, Marco was a game changer. Leon's the star of the show. Stephanie, you kept Leon and Schumer from killing each other. Well done. Uh, Joe, thank you for, for being a strong voice. Uh, Carrie, uh, for Bob, you, you always reminded us that we're dealing with people. And to Sergio, 
uh, and ben Michael Bennett's office, uh, y'all were a really incredible calming force. To Senator Hatch, you came into the debate at a time when we needed a lift. Orrin Hatch, I want to thank you profusely for jumping into the debate, adding to the momentum uh, that was created by the uh, so-called Gang of Eight. You provided momentum in committee. It meant a lot. To Kelly Ayotte, you, you jumped on board at a time when people were talking about what was bad with the bill. You came out to give us uh, number five after, uh, along with Senator Hatch, to give it momentum. That was an act of, uh, I think, tremendous political courage, and you did the uh, country a service by standing up and standing out at a time when it was tough. To Hoven and Corker, you put us over the top. I've never uh, enjoyed working with two people uh, more, but to Bob uh, Corker and John Hoven, uh, your, your efforts to come up with a new amendment uh, along with Senator Hatch and Senator Ayotte really made the difference. So I just wanted to recognize these people that they came along at a time when America needed them, and this bill is a result of hard work of many people at the staff level, but key senators who were not in the original bipartisan group came to the aid of the cause at a time we needed it. I will yield. Thank you very much for allowing me to say these words. Mr. President. Thank you. The senator from Utah. I want to thank my colleague from South Carolina for his kind remarks, and he's right on a lot of these folks really came to the forefront in this bill. Thank you. Rhode Island. Mr. President, let me also congratulate the, uh, Senator, our friend Senator Graham for his extraordinary leadership on this. Let me ask unanimous consent that I be able to speak for another five or six minutes before I conclude my remarks, and let me further ask unanimous consent that the interruption that we just sustained be moved to the end of my remarks so in the record uh, they are uninterrupted. Without objection. So we were talking about the ways to bring carbon fee revenue back to the American people. We should start, I believe, by setting aside about $140 billion, which is about 12 percent of the total, to help those lower-income households pay for that 2.5 percent increase that they will sustain. That would leave us with more than a trillion dollars to send back to the American people in other ways. That is a lot of money, even by Washington standards, and it can do big things. For starters, a trillion dollars every 10 years would go a long way toward reducing the national debt. Listening to some of the apocalyptic language used by Republicans about our national debt, you'd think that they might be interested in this. What are some of the other ways we could return those carbon revenues? Well, you could send out checks directly to the American people for about $900 per household or $360 per citizen every year. I know there are plenty of families in Rhode Island that could use an extra $900 a year, and these dividends would go right back into the economy because those families would spend it quickly. Or we could give seniors a raise. According to the Census Bureau, as many as one in seven Americans over 65 lives in poverty. In 2010 and 2011, seniors saw no Social Security cost of living adjustments, even though their costs for food and medicine and heating oil continued to rise. With the revenues from a carbon fee, we could raise the average benefit by $1,600 a year, or $130 a month. Last year, that would have been an 11 percent raise for every senior. Imagine that. And seniors living on fixed incomes tend to spend every dollar they get. So this money, too, would come right back into the economy. What about students? The outstanding government-backed student loan debt in the country rose to a record $958 billion last year. With a trillion dollars in carbon fee revenues, we could forgive all the federal student loan debt that American families are now carrying. Boom, done, gone. Or we could cut every student's and graduate's debt in half, saving Americans $45 billion a year in loan payments next year alone, 
and double the maximum Pell Grant from $5,500 to a little over $11,000, and still have money left over to permanently set the rate on subsidized government loans for undergraduates at 3.4 percent. That is the rate currently set to double next month if Congress doesn't act. Or we could use the $1 trillion to lower the top corporate tax rate from 35 percent to 28 percent. That reduction was Mitt Romney's corporate tax goal, and we could do it without adding a dime to the deficit. That's why Republicans like George Shultz, Art Laffer, one of the architects of President Reagan's economic plan, and others have expressed support for a revenue-neutral carbon fee. I've highlighted these four proposals to show that we could do big things with a carbon fee. These proposals, or some combination of them, or other ideas, are all possibilities opened up by carbon fee legislation. Shouldn't we have that discussion? Wouldn't that be better and more honest and more productive than trotting out the tired, tall tales of climate denial, better than pre pretending that it's a hoax? President Obama has defined the growing menace of climate change as the global threat of our time. It is. It is this challenge by which our generation will be judged. The grown-ups know it. NASA and NOAA and all the major American scientific organizations, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and our military leaders, a who's who of America's top corporate leadership, the property casualty and insurance industry, the Conference of Catholic Bishops, the list goes on. Mr. President, it is time for us to wake up and meet our solemn responsibility to our country and to its leadership role in the world. And we can do so in a way that allows us to do big things that will help the American people. As the President said, that is our job. That is our task. We have to get to work. I thank uh, the distinguished chairman of the Finance Committee and his ranking member for their courtesy. I yield the floor. I had remarks prepared to deliver on a bill that uh, Senator Baucus and I worked on together, the uh, SAFE Act, which will help from the beaches of Rhode Island to the mountain glaciers of Montana. And I would ask unanimous consent that those remarks uh, be put into the record rather than uh, keep him waiting any longer.